The first century, Jewish Christians suffered great persecution that tempted them to abandon their faith. The author of Hebrews wrote this expansive book to teach them why they should consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. 2,000 years later, these words and truths are still relevant for our lives today. Jesus is superior to anything we can think of. It's important to remember the preeminence of Christ and what it means when we face trials. We need to know him. Consider Jesus with us as we study the book of Hebrews. So I am Bill Young. I'm one of the eight pastors here at the Rock Church, and we're continuing our study through the book of Hebrews, Consider Jesus. This is part 16, and we're going to finish the, uh, chapter 9 tonight. So you may have noticed in, in chapter 9 especially, uh, there's a lot of talk about high priests, and offerings, and the tabernacle, and atonement, and a whole bunch about blood sacrifices. We've talked a lot about that, and we're going to talk a lot more about it tonight, these blood sacrifices. Last week, Pastor Mac, if you remember, I'm sure you do, uh, Pastor Mac talked to us about uh, what the blood of the Lamb means, and that Jesus is the perfect blood sacrifice. But the way he did it was so good. I'm sure you remember. Remember he um, he had you sing a song like a cor chorus director? Remember he started a part of the song and you finished it. Remember that? I don't sing as good as him, which isn't saying a lot. Uh, I'm just saying <laughs> I, I don't sing well. But let's do it again as a reminder. Can you finish this, this phrase? What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. And Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Not blood of lambs, but the blood of Jesus. And we know, I was thinking about this a lot this week, that people have sacrificed for a lot of things. One of the things I thought about this week was actually the 56 men who signed um, our what is this? <laughs> the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> 56 men signed it. And when they signed it, you, you, you understand, don't you, that they put their lives in jeopardy when they signed this thing. Because the uh, British Empire saw this as a, as a treasonous document. And there was, a, there was a bounty put on each one of these men's heads. And they were sought after, and they were persecuted, and they suffered. And I'm sure they counted the cost before they put their names on that piece of paper. They knew that they were going to have to sacrifice. And they did. And historically, I just want to share with you, because I love history, uh, that they did suffer. And collectively, there were five, historically five, who were captured by the British and tortured until they died. Five of them were tortured to death. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary War. Another had two sons captured in the war. Nine of the 52 fought and died from wounds, wounds or hardships from the war. And specifically, let me give you a few examples. Uh, this is Carter Braxton of Virginia. <clears throat> he was a wealthy planter and trader. He saw his ships sunk by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay for his debts, and he died in poverty. He paid a price for signing that document. And then there was Thomas Nelson. At the Battle of Yorktown, British General, General Cornwallis had taken over Thomas's house as his headquarters during the war. And Thomas Nelson instructed George Washington to fire on the house, destroy it, and he did. They destroyed his house, the home was destroyed, and Nelson died bankrupt. And then there was John Hart, who was driven from his wife's bedside as she lay dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. Uh, his fields and mills were destroyed, and for over a year he lived in the forests and caves, returning home only to find his wife dead and his children vanished. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion. So these were committed patriots who firmly believed that their cause was just and right, and they were willing to sacrifice for it. And I just want to say that 
to sacrifice for the freedom of a nation is honorable, but to sacrifice for the sins of the world is altogether divine. And that's what our Lord did for us. And the author of Hebrews tonight, as we finish chapter 9, makes the case that Jesus made the ultimate, yes, the perfect sacrifice when he died on the cross to purchase salvation for you and me and give us true freedom for all who put their faith in him. So tonight we're going to look at the perfect sacrifice, Hebrews 9, 23 through 28, as we finish chapter 9. Let's take a look at this. Here's what I want to cover. And I'm excited about this, by the way. I think God has something he wants to say tonight. Three reasons that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. And then, real briefly at the end, why does that matter? Why uh, was he the perfect sacrifice? Three reasons. And then why does that even matter to you and I tonight? So many years later. Let me give you a heads up what we're going to cover. First, we'll look at Jesus' sacrifice purifies us for heaven. That's the first reason. Number two, it provides forgiveness for you and I. And number three, it purchases salvation. And this is what the author is going to cover. So we'll jump right in. I'll have the verses on the screen here. The first reason that Jesus was a perfect sacrifice was that Jesus' sacrifice purifies you and I for heaven. And we're going to explain that here. Um, but let's first read the last verse from last week. This is where Mac ended. I think it's important that we cover it as I get started. So this was the last verse last week. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That is a very important verse. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But in context, what he's talking about was the cleansing, the purification that the high priest would do inside the tabernacle, cleansing everything with blood, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Again, chapter 9 talks a lot about the tabernacle, and that's, again, the context we have. So as we jump into verse 23, we understand the tabernacles needed to be cleansed. Okay? In, in, in the Old Testament, from Moses on down, given to uh, Aaron the priest, they would cleanse the tabernacle or the dwelling place of God. Tabernacle simply means dwelling place. And the tabernacle is where God dwelt, where he chose to dwell, okay? So let's pick it up in verse 23. It says this, It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So the, the tabernacle needed to be cleansed with the sacrifice of a pure um, uh White, really sinless is, is the idea, uh, a lamb that was killed and the blood was used to sprinkle on all the different things in the tabernacle in order to purify it or cleanse it. The Greek word for purified means to cleanse, to make clean, literally, ceremonially, or spiritually according to context. So to cleanse the tabernacle, a lamb had to be slain, an innocent lamb had to be slain, and the blood sprinkled over. This is the earthly tabernacle that we're talking about. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, whoops, there we go. Hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, they would, uh, the high priest would daily and uh, throughout the year and then yearly take blood and cleanse the different articles, whether it's the table that holds the bread or the menorah or the, the altar there or the in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, and he would sprinkle the instruments they used. All, almost everything, it says, was sprinkled with blood in order to cleanse it, to purify it. Why is that? Why do they even do that? Well, because everything on earth is flawed. Sin has flawed everything. The whole creation fell. When Adam sinned. And in this way, God was saying, I want you to do this in order to cleanse the tabernacle. Where I dwell, it needs to be purified. That's why they did it. The blood of lambs, perfect, spotless. In the daily sacrifice, in the, the day of atonement, once a year, they would go into the Holy of Holies. The high priest would actually tie a rope to his leg, uh, his, historians tell us, because when he went through the curtain, only the high priest once a year could do that. 
And this is where God dwelt. And they knew if they screwed up in there, God would strike them dead. And they didn't want some corpse laying there all year, <laughs> smelling up the place. So they would tie a rope to his leg. This is true. And he'd go in and do his thing. And if he didn't come out, they knew they could drag him out without going inside. And they cleanse everything with blood. That's the point. Now, the priest couldn't prick his finger and do blood like that, you know. It, that wouldn't work because it needed to be a sacrifice. And the blood had to come from the sacrifice that was dead. So it wouldn't work for two reasons. The priest had his own sin to pay for, so his blood was tainted. And number two, he would have had to have been killed to use his blood as a sacrifice. So there's two reasons why human blood wouldn't work. It was the blood of a lamb that was taken in and purified the tabernacle. It had to be done over and over and over. And here's the point that we've studied this last three weeks. It didn't work anyway. It didn't cleanse anything. It didn't cleanse anything. That's why it had to keep doing it year after year, day after day, because it never even cleansed the guilty conscience of the sinners, of the people. It didn't work. That's what Hebrews is telling us. It did not work. And we know it didn't work because this, as Brian talked about two weeks ago and Mac talked about last week, this is only a shadow or a copy or a photograph of what's happening truly in heaven, in the heavenly realms. So this isn't even, God was only having them do this so that we would get the picture of what's coming. And we know, in hindsight, that it was Jesus and his blood, that he was a lamb that was killed on the cross, and his blood was shed for us. And that's what cleanses us, right? Not, not this. This doesn't work. And, and here's how I think. Maybe you don't think this way, but here's how I think. Um, welcome to my brain. Um, I think that not anybody ever stop and think, you know what? This doesn't make sense. Because truly, um, blood doesn't cleanse anything physically, right? So I, I see this guy going in, and year after year, they're sprinkling everything with blood. I don't think, and I could be wrong about this, I don't think there's a mini-me high priest that's following along with him with some oxy-cleaner spraying and wiping off the blood off everything that he just sprinkled. I just don't think that happened. In fact, I got to think they left the blood there all, every year. They never cleaned it. So that place was a dirty blood fest. Blood everywhere. Think of the year after year, day after day, bloods. They didn't clean that up. It just sat there. So did anybody, anybody think, we're cleansing the tabernacle? But look how gross it is. It's just full of blood, every spatters everywhere. You know, I have a, a bucket in my, in my clothes closet. It's called my paint clothes. that is filled with what used to be perfectly good clothing until I got paint on it or got blood on it. And now it's ruined. And so I put it in my paint bucket and I use that. If I'm thinking, I pick one of those rather than just wear this to go paint something. And I have lots of clothes with lots of blood stains on them. I, I don't know why. It just seems like every time I do a project, I'm bleeding somewhere. I'll be working on something. I'll pick up a piece of wood and go, what's all that red smudge? Oh, I'm bleeding somewhere. Where am I bleeding? And I was looking at my hands today, thinking, I got so many scars on my hand. I got scars here. I got a big scar here. This one should have got stitches. This, this one did get stitches. And I got scars everywhere. And I th then I started thinking, why has my left hand got so many scars? And I thought, because of my right hand. <laughs> my right hand has a blade. My left hand is defenseless with the right hand. <laughs> I've cut myself so many times. And the blood doesn't come out. Men and women... God did not really mean for, for sins or for uh, the tabernacle to be cleansed. It didn't work. It was simply pointing toward what would work would be Jesus in the future being killed for you and I and his blood covering us and making us pure. That's what it was pointing to. In fact, when we try to cleanse things, when we try to fix things, it only makes it worse, makes it grosser. There's blood stains all over the place. When we try to do good works to fix our sin, it only makes it worse. The tabernacle needed to be cleansed. But we know, you and I know, that Jesus is the better sacrifice. Amen? Better than any lamb, better than any human. 
In fact, this is so cool. John the Baptist, who was Jesus's cousin, when he was baptizing and he saw Jesus coming toward him, um, I'll just get to that. He said, that the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God who is slain and sacrificed. His blood shed for you and I. He is the better sacrifice. He is the sinless, perfect, silent Lamb of God who was slain. He said he died at 3 p.m. And that's right when the, the Lamb, the daily sacrifice was taking place in the temple grounds in Jerusalem on that day. Jesus died at 3 p.m. It says in Isaiah and Jeremiah that the Messiah would be like a lamb being led to the slaughter. Jesus is that lamb. Everything else is just a picture pointing toward Jesus. And John saw it and he called it out. He's a better sacrifice. I, I love this quote. The whole sacrificial system established by God in the Old Testament set the stage for the coming of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect sacrifice God will provide as atonement for the sins of his people. I'll just end this little section by saying whatever sacrifice was needed, whatever blood was needed to cleanse the tabernacle in heaven or on earth, we know that the solution was Jesus' blood. It was Jesus' blood. So let's go on. You say, well, who did he die for? Well, he died for us, and that's what the next verse talks about. He died for you, and he died for me. In verse 24, it says this. It says, For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary. It was only a copy of the true. And he entered heaven itself, now to appear for who? For us. He did this for us. And that's the, that's the key phrase I want you to, to see in this, in this verse. He appeared for us in God's presence. Men and women, he died for you and me. That's why he died. Make no mistake about it. And what's really cool to understand is uh, the tabernacle in the desert with Moses needed to be cleansed because that's where God dwelt. Where does God dwell now? As a believer, you need to understand this, that God dwells in us, that we are, in fact, that tabernacle that needs to be cleansed before God can move in. And he does move in. And the only way he could move in is if we were cleansed by what? By the blood of Jesus. Since we are cleansed, since we are purified, God can move in. Let me show you some verses. Because some of you are looking at me like, is that true? Yeah, it's true. We are the tabernacle of God now. You and I, our bodies. 2 Corinthians 6, Paul tells the Corinthians, for we are the temple of the living God. We, believers. Ephesians 2, Paul tells Ephesians, and in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling, a tabernacle in which God lives by his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside and moves right in our bodies. And I love this verse, Ephesians 1. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of God's, uh, to the praise of his glory. You and I are the dwelling place for God, the tabernacle for God now because we've been cleansed. He can move in our body. It's like this. It's like if you took, if you had two big bags of gold, like all of us have sitting around our house, so you took those two bags of gold and you went to the biggest, baddest, thickest, vault you could find and you put them inside and they close the door and locked it up and they put guards around the vault. You know what they call vaults? They call them a safe. I mean, I mean you're safe. Once it's inside, you're safe. Once the spirit's in us, we're safe. So you put your money in there and it's guarded and it's got a moat and it's got electric fences, it's got tanks outside and, and it's safe. But you know something? There's a better chance of that money getting stolen than me losing the Holy Spirit before I die as a Christian. Because he says it's a, it's a guarantee. The spirit inside me is a deposit. He, God deposited his spirit in me and seals it. And the Bible says that no one can snatch me out of Jesus' hand. And that's true of you, believer. That should give you peace. That should give you peace. Aren't you tired of 
feeling dirty from your sin? Aren't you tired of feeling unsafe because of your, the things you've done? As a believer, you need to understand, God has cleansed you. He has purified you. He has deposited, deposited his spirit inside you, and it can't be taken out. You can feel safe. You can know you're purified. You can know God loves you. In fact, we know that Jesus' sacrifice is what makes us acceptable to God. There's nothing else. There's nothing else that can make us acceptable to God except the blood of Jesus that purifies us. In fact, all other religions, all other world religions are based on a whole different system. They would say most 90% of all world religions would say, oh, no, it's up to you to cleanse yourself. It's up to you to do enough good works to earn favor with God. That's what they say. They, some of them even give you a list or tell you, you got to go count these bees or you got to light this candle or you got to pray this many times or you got to spin these cylinders or you got to go to church or you got to read your Bible, you got to tithe, you got to do all these things and hopefully God someday will accept you. That's world religion. Christianity says, I can't do anything. I fall at your mercy, God. Thank you for dying for me. I receive that gift. Thank you for your blood. That's the difference between Christianity and all other world religions. If you're in a religion that says you've got to do this, this, and this before God will accept you, you're in the wrong religion. Only Jesus can cleanse your sins. No church can do that. No prophet can do that. Jesus only. He's all you need. Let me illustrate it. I love this illustration. My clicker is going crazy. My, this illustration. How many of you have seen the movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston? Yes. If you haven't, you need to go watch it. Okay. Watch it. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Go watch it. Um, because in the movie, it's a long movie, by the way, heads up. Uh, <clears throat> this is the scene of the Passover, the first Passover. God instructed Moses to tell the Israelites um, uh, when, when, when God was wreaking havoc in Egypt, and it was right before the, the death of all the firstborn was going to happen, God told Moses, tell the Israelites, every family, take a lamb, a spotless lamb, kill it, take its blood, wipe it over the doorframe of your, of your house. Take some of the blood and put it over the doorframe of your house and go inside and don't come out because I'm going to send an angel of death. I'm going to kill every firstborn unless there's blood over the doorpost. And the angel of death comes down. And this is what happened. This happened historically. It came down, and it came to the different doors, and it would look. And if it saw the blood, it would pass over. And a lot of people died. A lot of, every firstborn in Egypt that was not covered by the blood of the lamb died that night. Now, what I love about this picture, um, you see Charlton Heston sitting there. And, and those guys in there, the, the angel of death did not come down, step up to the door, look in and go, hey, hey, guys, how's it going in here? Um, I got bad news. You, you, and you, come with me. Come here. I got, you, 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 you did that sin that you always do, and you always say, I wish I didn't. I know you did it. Come out. I got to talk to you. Okay, I got something to say to you out here. Um, and, and you, uh, you, I, I don't know, you, you, you hadn't prayed enough lately. Why don't you step on out here? Now, you guys that are religious, you can stay right there, but the rest of you, come, come out here, I want to talk to you. No, in fact, what happened was the angel didn't even look inside. It doesn't matter what they were doing at the time. They could have been in great faith, trusting God, praying. Uh, in the movie, it shows some people are freaking out, screaming, oh, I'm going to die, in the movie. There are some slaves that don't even know God, and they're in there, but they're covered by the blood. Um, there's people that are, that are pacing back and forth, and there's somebody that's singing a really bad song. Watch it. You'll see they're singing a really irritating song. <laughs> and the angel doesn't pay any attention because it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the blood. And that's true in our life too. Oh, are you covered by the blood? You can rest. Oh, but I sin. I know. I can't sing very well. I know. I can't either. Doesn't matter. That's not what God's looking at. You know what he's looking at? The blood. 
Are you trusting in the blood? They were trusting in the blood. Jesus' sacrifice makes us acceptable to God. Jesus purifies us for heaven. That's the first reason. The other two will go quicker, trust me, okay? Here's the second reason that Jesus was a perfect sacrifice. First, because he purifies us, he cleanses us for heaven, amen? Amen. Number two, he provides forgiveness for all of our sins. Have you seen that ad? It's probably a billboard I've seen. Maybe it's a TV commercial or radio. It says, one call, that's all. Have you seen that one? Is that a, is that a lawyer or is that an HVAC thing? It's a lawyer. I like that because I remember it. I don't remember who it is, but I like what he said. For Jesus, for Jesus, what it is is one sacrifice, that's all. And, we're gonna, and, and the, the writer of Hebrews is making a, a comparison between what the priest had to do and what Jesus did. Verse 25. Nor did he, Jesus, enter heaven to offer himself again and again and again and again and again and again and again like the priest did. The way the high priest enters the most holy place every year. And oh, I didn't read the rest of it. Every year with blood that was not his own. We talked about that. It's the blood of an animal, not his own blood. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since creation of the world, since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all. How? Read that with me. He appeared once for all. One time at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. It couldn't be any clearer. Jesus died once for you and I. He paid the price for you and I. And that's a summary of what we just talked about. Um, But I want to make this point because I know so many people that struggle with this. Even Christian leaders I know struggle with this. I've had to correct some. I've talked to some things. You know, the way you start that prayer meeting, it's just, I I don't think it's biblical. (laughs) Um, And I'll explain what I'm talking about. Uh, So the question is, what do we do when we sin as believers today? Like you sin today. What do you do with that? How do you deal with that? What, What do you have to do? I know you're, you're, you don't want to answer because you're not sure if you're right. Um, most people say, oh, we got to confess those sins. And, and we have a verse right here, 1 John 1, 9, the Christian bar of soap. Uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So the, most Christians will say, when I sin now, I've got to confess it to get it forgiven. And I just want to clear up some confusion. That is not true at all. It's not biblical at all. Because we just read a verse that said, once for how long? Once until you sin? Did Jesus cover your sins? What did that say? Once for all. But wait a minute. This says if we sin, we confess it. And I'm not saying we shouldn't confess our sin, acknowledge sin. You're right. I'm wrong. That was incorrect. But where we, draw, where we slip off the, into the deep end is when we say, I have to confess it as a, as a believer. I need to confess it in order to have it forgiven. In other words, it's not forgiven until I confess it. That's a work of the flesh. That's you saying, I've got to do something. Rather than, that was wrong, I sinned against you. Thank you that it's been forgiven. Oh, let's start our prayer meeting by confessing how awful we are. Isn't that a fun way to start a prayer meeting? God, we're so horrible, we say I sin all the time. I've stopped prayer meetings with other pastors and said, let's not do that anymore. I'm done with that. Let's thank God for how much he's died for us. Let's thank him for paying for all our sins. How about we do that? Here's the funny thing about 1 John 1, 9. um, Two verses before that, here's an interesting verse. (laughs) But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Two verses before 1 John 1, 9. They're all covered. So what's he talking about? He's talking about in the, the confession is the good confession. Like Paul talked to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, and he said to Timothy, Timothy, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Eternal life is based on your one good confession. And there's nothing wrong with saying, God, I was wrong. I confess that. I acknowledge it. But don't cross the line to say, please forgive me. It's forgiven if you're a believer. It's forgiven. Do you believe that or not? You can walk in freedom or you can walk in fear for the rest of your life. I choose to walk in freedom and say, it's all forgiven. What I did was wrong. I admit it. 
oh, jump up in my dad's lap and say, thank you for forgiving me. It's either forgiven or not. It's forgiven. All means all, and that's all all means. That's all it means, all. Here's more verses, because this is so important. And say the word all when I've got it highlighted there. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but now he's appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 6.10, the death he died, he died to sin once for all all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Hebrews 7, 21, unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Now, this, I I just want to give you this. We're getting close to the end here. Um, I want you to think about your sin because I know you struggle with this. I I understand that. You have no problem. Here's where you're at, those of you that are believers. I have no problem believing that God's forgiven my past sins. When I prayed to receive Christ and, and he came into my life and forgave me of my sins, all my past sins were forgiven. I get that. That's what you're saying to me. But now you're wondering, what happens if I sin now? Because you will, and you have, and so have I, and I will. What happens? So here's how you think about it. I'm going to give you a chart because charts are always a good idea. Okay. <laughs> Think of it from the perspective of Jesus looking at your life. When, he's look, when Jesus is on the cross, he's looking, um, he's looking at eternity past this way. He's looking at eternity future. And your life is that, that hockey goal right there. That's where you were born and that's where you die on the timeline of life. Got it? From Jesus' perspectives, answer this question. When he died for your sins, how many sins had you committed at that point? None. You weren't even born. But Jesus paid for all your sins. How is that possible? You weren't even born. But he paid for all your You believe that. Now you just need to connect it in your brain. If that's true, then all sins future have been paid for. Every one of them has already been paid for in advance. You simply need to apply it to your life. Take the, the gift and say, thank you. It's, it's all paid for. We see that all sins are paid for in the past. But you got to understand, all means all, and that's all it means. All sins, past, present, future. So your future sins are already paid for. Oh, Bill, that means I'm going to go out and want to sin some more. Will it really? Is that true? I've never found that to be true in my life. For 40 years, I've never thought, oh, I'm going to go show God. If he's going to forgive me, I'm going to go sin like crazy. (laughs) But you think that, don't you? That can't be right. Or people have told you that. Oh, you'll just go out and do whatever you want then. You've got to do something to earn this. No, I love God so much for what he did for me. I just want to honor him with my life. He did so much for me. He died for me. Does that help? That helped. That's the second reason Jesus was a perfect sacrifice, because he provides forgiveness. And our forgiveness is what makes us pure, which makes us acceptable to God. And it's all tied back to Jesus and his blood. Here's the last reason Jesus' sacrifice was perfect. It's because he purchased salvation for believers. When we die, we will either be judged and sent to hell, or we'll be judged and sent to heaven, paradise, with God forever. Those are the only two options. So this verse talks about that. After death comes judgment for unbelievers. For those who haven't received Christ, who've chosen to reject him. Hebrews 9.27 is a famous verse out of Hebrews. It says, just as man is destined to die once and after that face judgment. This verse is packed. First of all, we're all going to die. Unless we're, as a believer, unless you're raptured, unless you're taken to heaven. Um, But we're all going to die. That's our destiny. You will die someday. And after that, you're going to face judgment. So, so this rules out reincarnation, by the way. You die once and face judgment. You don't die, then come back as a butterfly, then die again and come back as a squid, and die again and come back as a flower. You die once and you're judged. So you have this life to make a decision. We get one shot at this. Revelation 20, 15 says, Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You don't want to go there. You don't have to. 
God is literally dying to keep you out of hell. He's done everything in his power. In fact, he died a horrible death on a cross so that you wouldn't have to go to hell. The question is, will you receive that or will you reject it? The choice is yours. In 2 Thessalonians, it says, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. This, this is a serious subject. Man is destined to die once and after that face judgment. Are you ready to face judgment? I hope you are. If you're not, we can help you with that. This is what we're here for. We're not here to grow a big church or to make ourselves famous. We're here to point you to Jesus. Because he loves you so much, he died for you. And we want, want you to understand that so you don't end up here. Okay? I like what David Jeremiah said. He said, after death, all that remains for the unbeliever is judgment. That is why we must trust him in this life. We have one shot at this. Three months ago in February, I told you about my next door neighbor, Gus, who I've lived next door for 23 years. He found out he had a terminal lung issue, called me over and we talked and he said, I'm scared of dying. I said, I can help you with that. He says, I thought you could. And I shared about Jesus, everything I've shared tonight, about how Jesus came to die for him, pay for his sins. He could know he's going to heaven. He, for about an hour, and he understood it completely. I said, would you like to receive Christ? He said, who wouldn't? I said, I know a lot of people that, that wouldn't. Do you want to? He said, yes, I do. And he bowed his head, and he prayed to receive Jesus into his heart. And he died last Sunday. On Mother's Day at 3.02, I was there most of the day back and forth trying to help the family through this and then he passed away and I was there to pray with the family but as I prayed as uh, with his body there he was gone just a few minutes and I just thank God that God was gracious enough to save him three months before he died 83 years old God said I'm going to save that man I'm, he's in I said he's in paradise I know you're in paradise right now I know you see Jesus he's welcomed you into paradise because you've trusted in him. That happens. We have only this life to choose. Have you chosen yet? You don't know when your last day is. Jesus' sacrifice brings salvation for believers. For unbelievers, they're judged. For believers, we have salvation. Last verse here. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. I don't know how many times or how many different ways the author could say it. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time. That's a whole nother message we get to later. Not to bear sin, but to bring what? Salvation to those who are waiting for him. That's why he came. The word salvation in the Greek means to save or to rescue that's why Jesus came to save us, to rescue us from certain death. Christ died for us to purchase our salvation. It's the great exchange. In 1 Peter 3.18, last verse says, For Christ died for sins once for what? All. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. It's the great exchange. He laid down his life for sinners, which are you and my, me, so that we could be with him forever. The righteous for the unrighteous. He's righteous, we're unrighteous, the great exchange. And I'll leave you with this illustration before we answer the, quickly the question, why does it matter? Um, a few years ago, my wife and I, we bought Iowa State Fair tickets for all of our grown kids and their wives. Well, who is right? <laughs> but here's the deal. They had to come to Iowa. We were already there. We bought the tickets. So if you come and ask us for the tickets, we will give them to you, and you can go to the Iowa State Fair and eat cheese curds and hot dogs on a stick and Twinkies on a stick and ribs wrapped in bacon on a stick <laughs> and root beer, and, and you can do all of that, but you have to ask us for the tickets. And they all did, and we all went to the fair, we all saw the butter cow, and we all had a great time. Now, I am not saying that the Iowa State Fair is heaven. But I am saying it's close, okay? <laughs> it is close. They asked for the tickets, and we gladly gave them to them. Here's the point. They were already paid for. All I had to do was ask. Jesus has already paid for all your sins. All you have to do is ask him for the ticket. 
ask him to come into your life and forgive you. And he will. He will do it. Which takes us to our very last question. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that Jesus purifies us for heaven or provides forgiveness or purchases salvation? Because you and I get to, have to, need to, will make a choice. Will you receive Jesus' perfect sacrifice for your sins or will you pay for them yourself? If you're a believer and you've already received that free gift, then you need to understand you can walk in freedom and peace and joy in your Christian life. You don't have to have a weight of guilt over you all the time, even if you sin. God has forgiven it. God has forgiven it and he wants you to know he's forgiven it. He doesn't want you to walk around paying penance all day. He doesn't want you to walk around feeling bad all day. What good does that do? Acknowledge it was wrong, thank God for forgiveness, and move on, Christian. If you don't know Christ, you need to make a choice. You need to bow your knee to Jesus. You need to humble yourself, say yes to him. Come into my life, forgive me of all my sins. You can do that tonight. Take the ticket. It's waiting for you. It's waiting for you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you purify us for heaven. You cleanse us by the blood of Jesus. Thank you that your death on the cross provides forgiveness for all of our sins, every one of them, and that your sacrifice purchases salvation for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you offer it to every person here. Thank you for those who have said yes to you, that are on their way to heaven. Thank you for those who are here tonight to say, I'm not sure. If that's you tonight, come talk to me or go to the Connections booth and just say, I'd like to know more about how to get my sins forgiven, how to receive Christ, how to become a Christian. Ask us. We are here to help you. We just want to give you the information that we found in the Bible. God, we thank you again for this night. Thank you that you, Lord Jesus, are the perfect, ultimate sacrifice for all of our sins. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.